do you see um, a possible or inherent a conflict between the requirements of companies to have private data and states, governments, or other academic institutions to demand and require private data? Three to one go. I can take a crack now. Yes, of course. But um, I have this theory, and I don't know if it's true, um, but I hope it's true, is that the, so the current tech giants, the Googles, the Apples, the Gafo, that's the French home, Google, Apple, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, all work on a very locked data model. Google is a black box. We don't, you know, it works, but we don't know how it works. Um, Google Scholar bugs me. Um, but it works better than the Thomson Reuters index. Um, as we move into ever more increasing um, data, and as we move into what people are calling the Internet of Things, what I sort of think of as the Internet of Sensors, I think that there's an opportunity for someone to figure out how to make money on an open data model. If we're trying to make um, good advantage of an internet of sensors, so you have a sensor in your pocket, in your watch, in your car, but also on the road, in the buildings, um, all, the, all the weather sensors, etc. For that to really work effectively, we need to be sharing data across these different platforms. Um, so, you know, I can only do so much measuring my own um, thing with my little Apple Watch or whatever it might be, or my Fitbit. Um, if I really want to know things, I want to be able to compare it to others. I want to be able to see how it is impacted by things like weather um, and so forth. So for the Internet of Things to work, it seems to me that we need to have an open data model. And so the company that figures out the business model around an open data model, I think is going to have a leg up over the companies that are currently working on a locked data model. And there's no reason to assume that just because the Googles and the Apples and the Facebooks are dominant now, they're going to be dominant a decade from now. I mean, look at Microsoft. It's still a very dominant force, but not the force that we, were, that we feared a decade ago. So I think there's an opportunity there, and it'd be interesting to see what comes of it. So I would hope that people think a little more creatively and don't just think, oh, I have to lock it down to make a profit. I've got a, an example from the UK. We opened up a lot of public transit data and there's a firm called uh, Placer, which has a, has a product now called uh, Transport API, which pulls that stuff together. So what I was just saying that we, we have a firm in the UK which takes the public transit data, which um, public sector organisations, uh, local government and so on are making available. It wraps all of that up in, in a convenient API we were talking about. Uh, protocols and standards as a nice simple JSON based API you can use. As an app developer to embed that information about, you know, where, where can I get the next bus in London or where, where is the closest tube station, how long will I have to wait for a train, all this stuff is just available to you on tap. But for you as, as an individual developer to try and assemble all those different data sources, uh, weed out all of the uh, rubbish, if there will be rubbish. And that's actually a hard thing to do. So that, in that one case, uh, Transport API, there's, a, there's an example of a nice sort of intermediary that's adding value to the data. But that's public data. So we could say, well, OK, let's imagine, I, I mentioned Old Royce earlier on, let's imagine I'm a company like that. What data are I in my comfortable sharing? And that, that is a very difficult question. Now, you, you might know in the UK we have a thing called the Digital Catapult, which has a, a program of work which is entirely about that. It's about sharing <coughs> in certain circumstances, just up to a point in controlled conditions. I think it's also fair to say that some companies will want to work with the university with the research institutes to develop products and services, but using their own proprietary data and information. And I think we have to recognise at times those data will need to remain private because they are you know, the financial capital of the organisation. Because 
you know, they give them a business advantage or whatever. It's how we can then balance the need for openness against the support for commercial research as well. Yeah, I fully agree with the point. Uh, I fully agree that uh, some, some of the data will have to remain private, and not all data should be shared. Uh, but I also think that we will see emerging, uh, let's say, tensions also within the business sector, depending on different business models. So we will see companies that uh, are making money, as the first panelist was saying, by using open data. And these companies, of course, perhaps will try to push you know, or have more open data, whereas companies that instead are making money by collecting data and actually delivering services on the basis of the data they are keeping, and in some cases hiding for legitimate reasons. So there will be also many tensions within the private sector itself. So I'd like to uh, echo what uh, Mark said, um, and also the hope that it could change and might change. And there are, there are hopeful signs, I think, in in one of the moves recently from Apple to uh, promote the research engineers. I find that, that that is a contribution in an open manner, in an unexpectedly uh, positive manner um, from one of the companies we've just been discussing. We would like to see them change with their internal data. Okay, it's not their data, but they're facilitating a model which you wouldn't have uh, perhaps guessed they were going to do openly from the start. And, and this is extremely promising for medical uh, trials. On that, I think it's important to recognize that Sage Bionetworks was the vocal force behind Apple holding that up. And then I think probably it was Stephen Friend talking directly to Apple saying that you will actually benefit more if you use our research kit and make it more open. So what, the point there is I think that there needs to be continued pressure from the research community um, to, sh to maybe try and highlight where these opportunities might exist for that, that, that companies can profit from open data. Any further questions, comments from the floor? Yes, please. researchers for data sharing and I think like for, it, from every presentation we've been discussing today and yesterday almost everybody was mentioning that it's important to develop some incentives for researchers and from our conversations with researchers very often they, are, they would like to share their data but they would like is they, their data to be quoted to the same level of publication so basically if you publish of course your impact index rises you can progress your career in some of these how to actually evaluate data more, how to make sure that it's properly cited. So I remember Kevin Nashley from DCC was mentioning that journals would often not allow the data to be properly cited in the same way as publications and other articles. What type of movements we can develop as like societies, as organizations working data sharing to promote this move? Um, I think that's already changing. I think a lot of the uh, journals are already require are starting to require um, data citation. They're they're getting embarrassed by this lack of reproducibility problem. I was at a workshop just a few weeks ago hosted by Science Magazine, and the the workshop was strictly devoted to um, reproducibility of field sciences in particular. But one of the things that came out of it was trying to get more publishers around the common statement of principle of, um, of having original source data available. That said, I don't think data citation is that much of an incentive for um, people to share data. We've been able to cite data. It's not a hard thing to do um, at, at a basic level. 80% of the data is easily citable with current methods. Um, once it, it's on, once the journal and, and many journals already accept data citations, but researchers don't do it. And I've actually had feedback from researchers that say, "I don't want you to cite my data. I want you to cite my paper," because and citing my data actually dilutes citation to my paper. And when I go to my tenure review board, they only look at the papers. They don't look at the data. So the issue is not necessarily around citing data. It's around changing the the, the reward system within academia. Um, but it's also, I think, important to recognize that there are a whole lot of other players involved in producing 
a good data set and producing good software you know, and a variety of research products other than the principal investigator. And those people are not necessarily rewarded in the same way that the principal investigator is. So we shouldn't necessarily assume that, like I think I made the point yesterday, that a software developer wants a citation. Um, sure, they, they don't mind, but that's not how they're reviewed. That's not what, what their peers look at. That's not what they value in the same sense. So I think we should be thinking more granularly about what type of credit for what type of action. And there's actually a um, group called Project Credit. Um, it's projectcredit.net. Um, and they have this concept of transitive credit, so the credit that carries carries forward. Um, Dan Katz wrote an interesting paper on this. But part of it is that you would put badges for different roles involved in the research enterprise on products, be it papers or data sets or whatever. Um, and that those badges are machine readable as well as human readable, and that you could then sort of track where the where those things where those things went. And so then you it's a it's a form of recognition that is independent of there being a scholarly bibliographic publication. Because the other thing to recognize is that data are used well beyond scholarly discourse. Um, so I come from the earth sciences that might be used for, you know, risk mitigation, agricultural prediction, disaster response, land use planning, education. But all the, and all those things are valuable, but those are not being assessed. We're only worried about that scholarly publication. Very narrow assessment of value, it seems to me. I, I think it will be particularly interesting to see once the culture of sharing is more established, you know, what bit of the data from your experiment ultimately contributes to someone getting a Nobel Prize. If we can follow the um, thread between your experiment, your results, and being picked up and reused, and then, you know, the breakthrough, then I think we'll truly start to see the value of that sharing. Uh, recently, the Royal Society of London, there was a four-day discussion meeting very much about reproducibility and openness in science, but it kept going back to the need to change the scholarly reward system. Um, but one thing that strikes me is, I work in a funder, we're putting in, you know, doing a lot of planning on how we resource research going over the next, um, what's called spending review period in the UK. Every research chemist in the UK recognises there is a shortfall of people who are trained in data science. You know, to deliver the science that we need to do, I think as a global community, especially when we're looking at, say, the real big societal challenges we have to answer, involves working across disciplines at multiple domains of data. And for that, we have to really build the data science community to help deliver that science. So my hope is actually it becomes a self-correcting problem because the research community, the academic community, the university rectors, etc. will realise they've got to look after their data science staff, otherwise they can't actually deliver their research in the future. Well, certainly, research scientists can be, can, can some part of our problem, but still, yeah, I think that the National Evaluation Framework, they really have a major, major role to play. As we were discussing yesterday, uh, there have been some discussions in some countries, the UK is one of them, but at least so far, um, uh, national evaluators have been a little bit shy, perhaps because uh, it's a relatively new domain of uh, policy makers, so they still need to perfectly understand uh, what are the dynamics uh, uh, that are happening. And also because, I mean, there are very different fields. Some fields of science are much more data driven and data intensive than others. So, of course, before starting uh, using some of, the, of this criteria for evaluation, perhaps policy uh, makers still need to better understand and, and qualify the phenomenon itself. So I'd like to provocatively throw it back to you. Would you like to get credit before uh, or if it hasn't been peer reviewed? I think there are different ways of looking at this because there were cases of being discussed and I think it falls more peer reviewed. It's actually peer reviewed itself in a way that if your data is out and discussable data, it's sort of a peer review process too. If you don't make mistakes, somebody can pick it up on this and you can build up a new peer reviewing process on this. So I can, I'm not. I can clearly see the benefit of sharing and that probably at some point it could start rewarding itself when it's a bit but I'm just thinking 
what can be the best incentives for how we can actually change the reward system, as we all mentioned, like what can be our community's contribution to sort of perhaps help policy policymakers, what changes can be suggested? Because I remember at some point there was a discussion with the Welcome Trust, and one of the head of policy action from the Welcome Trust was mentioning that they have policy that would encourage data sharing, but they will never mandate data sharing, never sanction people who don't share data before they can have rewards for data sharing in place, because they don't have the system. So if you see what I'm asking the question myself, what can be done better? What can we contribute to really? Well, so it's not maybe just, um rewards but the sticks don't work I think that I mean so I, I, I've worked for a project for um, a long time that where the National Science Foundation um, required that the data be submitted not just at the end of your grant but every year and you didn't even get your next year's funding unless um, you submitted your data it was meant to be a monitoring program so they wanted the data to come in regularly um, so what that meant is that they gave us data yeah but they kept the good stuff um, the, the stuff that was nicely cleaned and well documented and so forth, they kept that and they just sort of gave us something so they could tick the box. So it didn't, so the sticks don't seem to really work. So I think from, from a data manager's perspective, I think what I found was much more helpful is if I could show real value so that if they got some real benefit by putting their data in my repository, that it, they could more easily integrate it with other data. They could easily compare it with similar data from their colleagues. Um, they could just see it on a map. You know, it just immediately, boop, it popped up, they could see it on a map. So little things like that, where they can actually see some value in making the data available, I think is really huge. And a big one, and I think I talked about this yesterday, and I think Kevin talked about it, um, People want to know how their data are used. And if they know how their data are used, they're usually quite willing to share. Because they're, they're, they're afraid of being scooped or someone misinterpreting their data. But if they see that that's not the case, they're usually pretty excited about people sharing their data. They, they learn something from it. Um, so I think making that, that those benefits more visible, I mean, that's, it's kind of abstract, but um, is, is a step in, in the right direction. I think Kevin mentioned it, the, this layering of services on top. So basically their, their incentive is actually because it makes it easier, it makes it uh, uh, better to, to get collaborators, it makes it uh, more uh, rewarding in itself, the enterprise, not some abstract reward uh, system, which we are trying to change as well. And I think there is hope for that. We've been in many, many uh, different uh, conferences recently where people are, are pushing for that change and uh, the bodies that might affect that change are actually discussing it as well. So there's hope. Just one thing to add there. Um, I, I think it, it's probably something people here are very profoundly aware of, but so many fields of science are becoming more and more data intensive. And I think about what you guys are doing at CERN and some of my buddies at the Francis Crick Institute that's majoring on genomics. The data is huge, there's more and more of it, you can only do so much. So actually the culture of sharing helps the whole community, the, the 450,000 researchers I was talking about in life sciences in Europe, you know, there's only so much any one of those people can do. So actually making it easier for those people to work together, uh, you know, where they, where they choose to, cooperation, um, can't, can't be a bad thing. I have a question about technologies uh, from other walks of life, let's say, from other aspects of our activity that, that are somehow adopted um, in the academia. Um, two examples. Uh, one is, um, well, the success of BitTorrent um, inspired, for example, academic torrents, right, which are, um, uh, which is a project which might or might not uh, succeed. And so, so this is basically a question to you, how you um, have you envisaged such um, initiatives to, to decentralize, decentralize, democratize, if you will, uh, certain 
aspects of, um, of academic process. Um, the other example uh, is, uh, is the success of uh, Bitcoin uh, and generally BitChain based methods, which also are now um, let's say replicated in many other areas. Uh, full disclosure, I am a co-author on, on, on a paper of a paper on, on minting uh, persistent identifiers using a decentralized uh, blockchain based um, uh, approach. But in general, I'm, I'm curious about your views on, on democratization, decentralization of, of certain um, processes that were traditionally centralized. Uh, and do, do you see these as opportunities, as perhaps threats um, to, to the academic process? Perhaps you know it's too early to say you know what are um, what, what is the path that the scientific enterprise is taking. Uh, there are some challenges and some benefits associated with this uh, decentralization of science, uh, but many of these are still open questions. So. Sorry, go ahead. I don't see it so much as a threat because science is democratic, and many of the tools that we use, like the internet, grew up in a democratic fashion and uh, we're trying to defend them to, to stay in that manner. Um, but I think there's some thresholds that, uh, that have to be uh, crossed. If we have to have a service that we can absolutely rely on, and to get to that phase, we have to create it, sustain it, and then let it grow and evolve by itself, then there's a threshold after which you can let go and, and it can just happen. For, for BitTorrent specifically, uh, that's an interesting case because BitTorrent inspired others to do similarly because it's actually a very smart technology um, and BitTorrent now have realized that there are markets that they are not touching and they would like to and they are now trying to put up BitTorrents for academia themselves, BitTorrents for uh, economics and things like that. So, so trying to uh, clean up their act if you like and, uh, and, and show their utility of, uh, of their smart technology. Uh, what can say? Um, except I wanted to add just one thing. I'm, I'm very intrigued. I want to read your paper. Um, cause I just heard about this concept a few weeks ago, actually, at that science workshop. Because I think the current me model of registering persistent identifiers is going to be a bottleneck. And I think people actually, with the DOI in particular, but I think any sort of registered identifier, any handle-based system, um, people expect more out of it than it's designed to do, they still rely on human due diligence. There is nothing about a DOI that ensures persistence of the object. Nothing at all. It still relies on human due diligence. And that's often forgotten. So if we can automate that more and make that more independent of human actors, that would be, that would be great. So I think your point about the blockchain is a very interesting one because in, in the broader internet we've seen this kind of winner-takes-all um, syndrome. For example, the DNS, which controls how we, we use the internet in such a profound way, it's really in the control of a very, very small group of people. Um, the idea that you could say, well actually, you know, no publisher, no government controls this flow of information, it, it's, it's a very powerful one. I just found your paper and I'll Tweet a link to it in very interesting. Sorry, I, I didn't mean it to be a plug. To <laughs> it was just an example that it. uh, it's naturally. But thank you very much. Information sharing. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Yes, please. Uh, my question is for, uh, regarding data standardization in terms of formats, because uh, the question to you is uh, would, would you push or suggest some outline? regarding this topic because I have bioinformatical background and that's a disaster. I mean, people are uh, pushing pushing the, uh, the data which is not specified, it, it changes because it's, it's, it has no specification. So maybe maybe it is a chance, uh, this open, openness for research data to specify some data in some domains. I know it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing, but it's doable still. Uh, and because it takes much uh, of sci scientists' life uh, computational scientists to, uh, to part this data, to, to read it, uh, and, and so the question is whether you would recommend or suggest or, or rather a ban, uh, a ban uh, 
uh, data standardizing uh, within open op as open standards, of course, but but, but yet standardizing uh, within uh, opening the research data. So, I personally think that yes, I mean it can only help, um, but it may be a stick and carrot problem again. But the while it, it makes utter sense to discuss it at, at length, come up with uh, ideal solutions. I suspect that the, the real driver for change will be when the very same scientists that don't have the standard format want to use somebody else's that doesn't have the standard format and they start to realize the benefits to for both of doing it. I think that's going to accelerate it quicker than uh, those, both things can go on in parallel. Yeah, just to add to that, um, when I was working with Arctic data, I had the same problem. <coughs> The data were a higgledy piggledy mess. Lots of little ASCII files, um, all formatted uniquely. Or and sometimes they change mid mid time streams because you know a new graduate student came along and decided a better way. Um, and in some cases, it's like Tim was saying, the community came together and said, "All right, this is intolerable." And so a, a particular disciplinary community maybe worked towards sort of a standard. When that happens, that's I think the most effective. But what would be cool is if we could define sort of a, a meta level. So for one of the things that I was working with, with Arctic data, was, it was it's a bunch of sensors. And um, so they're either buoys floating in the ocean, or they're maybe you know, meteorological towers, um, what have you. Um, and so they're measuring all sorts of different parameters. But there are certain common elements. You know, some sensors are fixed in space, but vary in time. Some are temporally rel relatively short, but they move in space, you know, like a transect or something like that. Some are both, like a buoy that floats around the ocean. So maybe those are three common classes that we could start to, so I, and I think if we, so we're never gonna have, you know, one or even a dozen standards, but you know, if we could start defining some upper level classes and then get the communities from the bottom, so it sort of works from the top down and the bottom up at the same time, I guess. I wanted to ask about data peer review. Is, do you think this is something very advantageous that we should uh, have data journals and all the data should be peer reviewed? Or is this great, finally we have a system where we have research outputs that do not need to undergo this process and be rejected? Or uh, is this something valuable that we don't have data peer review? So, I think I'd like to, uh, to echo Martin's point that uh, it is an opportunity for not having to go down that route. Um, and I, I think that the not having to think of the alternative uh, ways of, of measuring it would be nice if just the utility of it, of it could be uh, could be enough for our community to, to benefit. I think we have to be really careful with the concept of peer review of data. I, I don't like it at all. Um, who are the peers? Um, as Kevin and I both emphasized yesterday. Um, the people who collect the data are the, are the last people you want to ask about reuse. Um, and th now that said, I think that there's reasonable, like an audit of the data. You know, make sure that there's decent documentation, make sure that the uncertainties are described, make sure that the unit serves there. You know, the, you know, like I say, an audit. But it's not a professional assessment of the validity of the data. I think the best assessment of the validity of the data is reuse. And so reuse is, in a sense, a form of peer review. So I don't like the concept of peer review. You know, review, yes, but not in the same sense as reviewing an article. Um, and I think the whole concept of data publication and um, j data articles is a patch. And hopefully it'll go away in a few years. Um, it's, it's, it's a workaround trying to impose the data, the, the journal publishing system on something that is very different from an article. A data is a screen, not an object. Um, so I, I, I think that's the whole concept of data papers. This is my personal opinion. Um, I have a paper on the topic. Um, is, is misguided. Well, I would um, possibly beg to differ. Oh, I'm sure many, many people differ. Um, in the sense of the whole concept. <laughs> We tried to apply the language of scholarly publishing into the data space to try and start to find ways of rewarding researchers and data scientists' effort that were putting into data. 
so we use the language of journals, the language built around journals, but peer review for data could mean something very, very different <coughs> than the traditional way peer review research article. I think my concern is that, as I mentioned in my talk, in a world where anyone can put anything up on the web, so to speak, we still need ways of flagging stuff to say, actually, we as a community think this is good. Now, how we do that, yes, we have to maybe develop better ways of doing that, but I've still, I'm still a strong believer there needs to be ways of flagging the quality of material so people who come from outside the domain, and maybe come out from outside the research, can actually say, yes, I can see this has some level of quality assurance applying to it. The way we do that at the moment is quite often through the brand of the journal. You know, so the fact it's been published in a paper or in a journal of a particular name, people say, oh, okay, then I, I can trust that research to some extent because it has, it's gone through a quality assurance process which is guaranteed by that journal. And I can see it's a lot of disagreement there. But those are the tools we have at the moment. And those are tools that apply to data. Often, you have the quality of the data and the situation. Like, it's not a personal right. website. Yeah, that's another way of doing it, but it's, it's how we can actually, it's how we can signpost stuff to ensure we can indicate quality of it. But then it, we have to then trust that the repository is take, has got to do some quality assurance step to say, I've taken that in, I've put my name to that data, how do I as a repository know those data are, are of sufficient quality and I'm prepared to vouch for them, so to speak. It, it, it's an interesting, yeah, we've got to solve that problem, and I think one model state peer review or one way of doing that, and not the only one. But quality is always in the eye of the beholder. So I think that some, some assertion of, of best practice, that you know, this data was collected in the, be, in the way that we think is appropriate, and it's well described, and, but we can't guarantee that it is of sufficient quality for all applications. That's it's, fair enough, yeah. Um, so, it, because, so that's where I think the, the publication metaphor, and it is a metaphor, um, get, leads to some false conceptions. And so that's why I think we have to be very careful about the language around things like, when we say things like peer review and publication, that yes, we want those attributes of, of quality data for reuse, but that doesn't mean that peer review is the solution to doing that. I, I think we can learn a lot, actually, from the uh, fake um, journal study about chocolate, you know, the thing that Ben mentioned earlier on. So let's imagine I upload my data set, and actually that study was like 15 people. So anyone who knew about these things would say, whoa, you, there are no statistically significant conclusions here. Um, when you upload it, who's to say that the place you upload it to can't, you know, tick a little box or give you a little badge to say, you know, it meets this or that requirement. You might assert that I've carried out this study in a particular way, but there are things that could be checked for you, could be checked algorithmically. And I think also um, we've got to keep in mind the, the sort of social sharing mechanisms. So that, that peer review could be quite a lightweight thing. It could be that these five people have all said, actually, you know, this is really really good data set. I'm going to pick this up and I'm, I'm using it already. It doesn't have to be peer review in, in the journal process sense at all. Let me just, I, I will not enter this debate uh, between peer reviewing data or not, but uh, I mean, this idea of like, minimizing the quality of the data is certainly a key issue, and not only for open research data, for other kinds of open data, for example, open group data. What we are observing, in, for example, in the country is that uh, many countries to comply with uh, open gov agendas, they're building their repositories, but then they're dumping their data sets that perhaps you know, have not been checked enough, and at the end they're not so useful because you know, people cannot use them. So the metaphor you said that we have, which is the publication metaphor, is perhaps not the only metaphor. Um, the open source community on software has other metaphors of how to uh, accumulate value or, or judgments on, on the software. The automated testing ideas might be uh, transferable to data. So when you upload it to the, uh, to the repository, it might just go through some, some validations of structure and uh, annotation that could just give a badge 
um, and then the sort of the stack overflow metaphor where, where you, as you say, you, you accumulate uh, votes, kudos. You can, yeah, kudos, um, in a manner which experts actually appreciate because it's experts uh, um, helping experts. So I think all of those could be used as metaphors for, for the data and not just the, uh, the publication. <coughs> uh, I, 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 I'm not sure if you'll uh, remember one of the slides uh, presented by uh, Jean-Claude Bundelmann yesterday because it was cooperated. Uh, at the side there was one star and inside that star there was uh, two words, citizen science. And uh, mm, keeping in mind that uh, we have big data, a lot of data, not enough scientists to analyze that. And at the same time, we have a great asset, a great capital, human capital, a lot of people with master degrees in science, in arts, and so on. Uh, and I'm one of the representatives of such a society of citizen scientists. Uh, I looked at a lot of data uh, published openly, and to be quite frank, uh, very frequently that data is crap. And uh, as a taxpayer, <laughs> Uh, when, when I uh, simply paid for the research and for government, I expect that the quality of the data is high, that I can re reuse it. Uh, so, in my opinion, it's the obligation of the person who publishes such a, let's say, result. It's called uh, output, intellectual output out of uh, uh, research projects. I expect that if money are paid, the quality should be high. If it's not high, either money must be returned to the to the taxpayers, and or the data could correct it. So I think that uh, we as taxpayers and uh, let's say citizen scientists should take a very strong stance that sorry guys, either you provide high quality data or return the money. <laughs> yeah, good luck defining quality. <laughs> good luck to get the money back. Pardon? Good luck to get the money back. No, no. Uh, uh, to be, uh, for instance, if you run a research project and you publish the data, and I, uh, the data is not uh, cannot be used for uh, replication of the research, it means that uh, the research is not correct. Uh, you, you, you simply didn't meet the criteria of the publicly funded research. Simply, my assert, as, assertion is that. Sorry, guys, but uh, in the whole, uh, we are paying for your uh, for your work, and we expect that as citizens, citizen scientists, we would like to replicate that. I think it's fair to say, speaking as a funder, we wouldn't, rather than demanding the money back, what we would do is say, well, actually, you've jeopardised your chances of getting funding in the future. We can achieve the same end, but um, it's a case of taking, I think, the data into account as when we're assessing researchers credibility when they're you know, of delivering research, when we're looking at research grant applications, we should also be looking maybe at the data side as well as just the research papers. Uh, so does it mean that, uh, uh, as, for instance, like, uh, as a part of lobbying, can we uh, convince the European Commission that uh, the obligation will be that the quality of the data disclosed uh, in, in research projects should allow replication of the, uh, le 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 let's say, the calculations of models by citizen scientists? <laughs> Simply, uh, uh, to be quite frank, we met several uh, members of uh, European Parliament and we, uh, we can take steps to lobby for that. And the question is if scientists and researchers are, uh, from, uh, from publicly funded institutions are ready for such a challenge, yes, because it is a challenge. So, so there is um, one observation here, not, not all of the data is realistically going to be able to be manipulated, processed by, by a citizen scientist. So we think about the uh, huge network of machines that Tim and his friends have to manipulate the Large Hadron Collider data. You're only ever going to get a tiny fraction of that that you could actually process yourself. But also, um, in many cases, you either you require specialist equipment or you require specialist software. And you could say all software that, for example, the EU funds part of research projects, all software to be used or created in those projects will be made open source. That's actually quite a big thing to us because scientists routinely depend on packages um, that, that 
you know, are hugely successful commercial products, and you could say, well, stop using those. So it's quite, it's quite a complex um, situation. It's, it's, we would say in, in the UK, the thin end of the wedge. <laughs> So, not to contain the, uh, the discussion, which can uh, carry on. on it it was to start a discussion, yes, yeah. to, 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 to take a different look, yes. <laughs> no, we, we have uh, lunch to discuss further. <laughs> but uh, I'm conscious of the fact that certain of the, uh, the members on the panel have to uh, leave in the taxi soon. So, uh, perhaps we should just have some concluding remarks, if there are any, and then we'll uh, close the session. So, Julia, do you want to start? many, many passionate researchers and people working on, uh, on this topic and uh, I think that the, the challenge you have is, uh, let's say, uh, convince uh, the researchers that perhaps uh, are less engaged than you are in uh, open data sharing and open, uh, open access. So probably this is the main challenge, to reach those researchers that are in, in fields that perhaps are less uh, you know, engaged in, uh, in open access and open data, then uh, the, the, the open access, access community is a great I would say that you know, open science is the future, but the road to getting there is going to be a little difficult at times. There's lots of problems we're highlighting, but I think we have to stick with it because we can see that's the way that research has to go in a, in a, in a digital world. So in, in my talk this morning, I, I spoke about how people like us here today are the pioneers, and we're trying to figure out how to do this. And I was very encouraged by Martha's talk about uh, Cambridge, where you so you kind of effectively you came back from an event like this or a series of events and said, right, here's how we're going to approach this, and then you worked with hundreds of researchers at your institution to actually make it a reality, and and I, that that's a lot of work, but that's actually what needs to happen next. So good luck with that. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I too am optimistic. I, I'm very encouraged by the discussions we've had, and I uh, remain um, uh, very optimistic that we're going to get there soon because there's such a resonance. Every time that we discuss these with different audiences, there's always the same resonance. So um, carry on and believe in it. I come from Boulder, Colorado. Um, in Boulder, about a year and a half ago, we had a really big flood. We had, oh, I got to translate here, I don't know, 50, 60 centimeters of rain in three days. Um, so Boulder's at the base of the mountains, and so whole sections of mountain fell off. Whole canyons were created. So I'd always thought of erosion as a, as a gradual process, and, um, but it turns out it's actually a step function. Um, and I've been working on this sort of data sharing culture for probably a couple decades now. And I've always likened it to dripping on rock, a slow, gradual process, because what we're trying to do is change culture. And I think that's what we just heard from several of the panelists. But I think data is having its day. Data, it's a, it's a big moment. Data are having more attention than they've ever had in, in their lives. And maybe we're getting that flood. Maybe we're getting that step change in, in culture. And because I do think culture actually, if we look at other cultural changes, that it does start very, very gradually, but suddenly there's a big jump. Um, and maybe we can achieve that with this notion of an open data culture as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much to all the panel. And I think we should perhaps leave the last word to uh, our hosts and organizers. Uh, thank you very much. Before I will start, uh, I would like to say thank you to um, Mark 
uh, who has to leave us immediately because the taxi <laughs> is waiting. Thank you Mark, very much for being with us and uh, for inspiration for your talks. Thank you. Um, as everyone is already thinking about uh, returning to their cities and homes, uh, I will be not talking uh, too long. Uh, I just uh, want to say uh, thank you to a long list of people, a bit, even a bit longer than typical thank you list from Oscars Gala. Uh, but uh, I try to uh, do that uh, briefly. And uh, I think uh, it will be not useful to, to summarize uh, the conference because uh, the panel discussion was uh, excellent uh, wrap up of, uh, of our conference. So thank you for our discussion. And um, I would like to say thank you to, to all our uh, participants of uh, the panel. Uh, Julia, Martin, uh, our moderator team, and Mark, thank you. Uh, to all people in our conference room who decided that sharing data is important and is necessary that they decided to join our conference. Uh, I would like also um, give a special thanks to our organizing committee, um, Paolo, probably is at the airplane. Kevin Ashley, uh, who supported us very effectively. Um, Sarah Karan, uh, she was not able to join us uh, today, uh, but uh, her support was important to us and uh, to people from ICM, Łukasz Bojkowski, Jakub Sprott and Marta for her technical and emotional support. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to announce that we have planned to organize a research data management workshop addressed to researchers. It will take place on 22nd of June. Uh, if you are interested uh, in participation, please contact us. Um, what else? And uh, I'd like to invite Łukasz Polikowski for a brief announcement of something that will be interested to you, I guess. Yes, so um, uh, tomorrow we will, no, together with uh, Paolo Mangi, who had to leave uh, already for, for his uh, plane, and with Johan Schirwagen uh, from Bielefeld's uh, University Library. Uh, we are organizing a, a workshop on digital um, scientific communication, which will take place, uh, which will be co-located with the Theory and Practice of Digital Libraries Conference in uh, Poznan. Uh, this, time it's, uh, this time around it's in Poland, so it might be uh, more convenient to many of you uh, to, to, to get there. Um, and I would like to, to to advertise this uh, this event to you know to um, the paper submission deadline is on July 5th, so there's still plenty of time to um, uh, to submit. Uh, we have a Twitter uh, and uh, there's a web address. So if you if you Google WDSM uh, workshop on digital safety communication, you will you will find us. Um, we're basically interested in anything which has to do with with modern ways of sharing data. Um, of, of communicating uh, in, in, the, in the digital say, era. So, uh, thank you for this. Uh. Sorry, one more, one more uh, issue. Uh, I think it is important uh, to make the knowledge shared yesterday and today uh, make accessible to a wider audience. Uh, therefore, we have a plan to prepare a post-conference publication. Uh, we will wait for extended abstracts uh, till the end of the next week. Uh, and uh, all talks uh, are recorded. Uh, and we have a plan to ask all uh, speakers for permission uh, to publish all talks on our website. Thank you very much. Probably lunch is coming. Thank <laughs> you.